With the breakup of communist Yugoslavia, war came back to Europe in 1991. Montenegro, the smallest of the six constituent republics, also faced an uncertain future at the time. But Montenegro was spared the fate of the neighboring Bosnia and Kosovo. It was the only one of the successor republics which managed the split from the former Yugoslavia without armed conflict and without bloodshed. Since 2006, Montenegro has been an independent state. Since ancient times, most visitors have reached Montenegro via the sea and the Bay of Kotor. At almost 30 kilometers, this is the deepest fjord in southern Europe. For many centuries, the bay was a harbor for Venetian boats on their way to the Orient. The Austro-Hungarian monarchy also established its southernmost naval base here. Stevan Kordic was born and grew up in this place where Eastern and Western cultures meet. He teaches mathematics at the Marine University of Kotor. He also has a passion for the photography and architecture of the place of his birth, however. My earliest memories are associated with this church, St. Mary of the Rock, because it is the first church I ever went in. I was still young, maybe four or five years old, when my grandfather Grazia, who lived in the neighboring village of Strp, brought me here. Because it is one of my first memories, I feel very closely connected to this church, both for family reasons and later also for professional reasons. For his exhibition, Montenegro, Meeting Point of Religions and Cultures, Stevan Kodic photographed religious buildings such as the Catholic Cathedral, St. Trifon, and the Orthodox Church, St. Luca, where both Catholic and Orthodox Masses used to be celebrated. On my father's side, my family is of Serbian nationality, and on my mother's side, they are Croatian. If, like me, you come from a mixed family, then it is said that you are first and foremost a Burkel. This means I belong to the region of the Bay of Kotor. For me, this area comes first, everything else comes after. Behind the coast, the Black Mountains rise powerfully. These gave the country its name, Montenegro. It is a rocky barren land. The influence of Catholic Europe remained limited to the coast. In the mountains, Slavic tribes ruled who were famous for not bowing to anyone. A wild country. In May 2006, there was a referendum on the independence of Montenegro. The Prime Minister was Milo Djukanovic. This picture shows our happiness when we found out the first results of the referendum and knew with certainty that the magic figure of 55% of the votes had been reached. A little more than half of the approximately 600,000 inhabitants voted for an independent Montenegro, with around 45% wanting to remain in the State Union of Serbia and Montenegro. Despite all the fears that the new state would fail, the Djukanovic government declared Montenegro independent on the 3rd of July 2006. The defeated group in the referendum accepted this. Conflicts did not occur.
Luckily, it became clear that we were right. The people trusted us and supported our idea. But the most important thing is that there were no more risks after independence. Montenegro has remained stable, and our lives are getting better from day to day. Montenegro's population is greatly mixed, both ethnically and in religious terms. Montenegrins, Serbs, Albanians, Bosnians and Croats, Orthodox, Muslims and Catholics live closely together. The diversity of ethnic groups has now become a symbol for the young tourist destination, like here at the Fisherman's Festival, organized by Tijana Kotaraz in the old town of Budvar. Only the tourism slogan, Wild Beauty, is a reminder of the wild Montenegro of the past. The wild stories which are sometimes told about Montenegro and also about other parts of the former Yugoslavia, about the whole of the Balkans, are a challenge for us. Maybe we should even fuel these ideas a little and emphasize that this is what makes the Balkans what they are. That on the one hand, we are interesting because of our traditions, and on the other hand, that we also think in a modern and contemporary way, especially in the last few decades. Everyone who comes here with prejudices leaves Montenegro with a completely different perception and a different picture than the one they used to have of Montenegro. In October 2007, Montenegro signed an agreement with the EU as a first step towards future membership. It is therefore ahead of its big brother, Serbia. The most important thing for me is that we were able to put into practice what we had resolved to do. We have achieved our independence, fulfilled the high European standards and maintained internal stability. In Montenegro, unlike all of the former Yugoslavian republics, which unfortunately had to go through war, we have been able to keep peace. In Montenegro, we maintained our multi-ethnicity, even in a very difficult period, while all around us religious and national conflicts were raging. We led Montenegro to independence again. We made it possible to create our own future and a future as part of Europe. The hotel and travel agency owner, Branko Casanegra, is also working on a European future. He is a man between tradition and modernity. It's very easy and simplistic. Welcome the guest in the hotel, in the restaurant, on the beach, exactly how you would welcome a friend at home, and then everything will be fine. Since independence, the number of tourists has increased to more than a million visitors a year. Per head, Montenegro attracts as many foreign visitors today as France. This is a challenge for the country. We had, since back in the 14th century, autonomy, our own republic under the patronage of Venice. It was called Pestrovska. Then, after the fall of Venice, we were under the patronage of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy for a hundred years. I opted for the independence of Montenegro because I wanted to decide myself about my own fate. This means I wanted to do this in my state. Branko is one of the most important tourism managers in the region of Budva. But he still finds time for his passion, fishing in the Bay of Petrovaz. Like his male ancestors, they were all fishermen.
I see myself much more as a father of a family when I bring a cassetta, a crate, a crate full of fish with me and put it on the table. When I do this, I see myself more as someone who is supporting his family than when I bring money home. A holiday residence to cater for the highest requirements. The former fishing village of Sveti Stefan near Budva. Here, Tiana Kotaraz works as a manager. When it comes to the relationship with my husband and my family, my young daughter, for me, the fight for the emancipation of women in Montenegrin families is also a constant issue, even if it does not seem like it, and even if I probably look like I'm emancipated. Despite the influence of modern values, which she is constantly confronted with in the tourism industry, Tiana, like almost all Montenegrins, still hangs on to the traditional Slava celebration, where homage is paid to the family's particular saint in the family circle. The family is a place of refuge. It is always there when I have problems. And when I'm happy, I can also share this happiness with the family. Even though I have a lot of friends, good friends around me, I am not as close to anyone as I am to my mother and my sister. And I hope it will also be like this with my daughter in the future. The slogan of the wild Montenegro was not always as innocent as it is today. In 1991, Croatian Dubrovnik was fired at by Montenegrin units of the Yugoslavian People's Army. A war for peace was the cynical official name of the campaign. In 2003, Kocha Pavlovic made television footage taken at the time into a cinematic accusation. For two or three years, I've been showing this film here in Montenegro, mainly on a small scale, in schools, etc. The reactions differ greatly. These young people usually react with surprise and even with shame. There is also a certain aggressiveness towards the events of the time towards this legacy which has been inflicted upon us. I think it is our responsibility and obligation to reproduce this historical event in a film. We all know the reason for this. The history is often presented to us only in parts, without us understanding the connections. In Dubrovnik, the Montenegrin leaders fought on the side of Slobodan Milosevic, whose family comes from Montenegro. Heavily manipulated by the media at the time, most soldiers still do not want to talk about their experiences. In the media, the necessity of a preemptive war was preached. This slogan, War for Peace, was also created here. Montenegro supposedly attacked Dubrovnik, not to capture it, but to triumph and therefore to keep the peace. Here we showed our willingness to plunder, to destroy senselessly, to kill civilians. It is here that the story begins, which makes us look at our past in a completely different light. Montenegro's ally of Milosevic was Milo Djukanovic, who was 29 years old at the time. From our school books, we learned how hard our ancestors had to fight to establish a community of South Slavic people. The breakup of Yugoslavia therefore hit me very hard. 
In 1991, the young Prime Minister Dukanovic and the ruler in Belgrade, Milosevic, were still standing side by side. Later, they became sworn enemies. There was no friendship there. It could be said that efforts were made for several years to bring about cooperation. I am convinced that Yugoslavia can develop successfully. His rhetoric, at the start at least, definitely raised hopes. It sounded as though he was determined to drag Yugoslavia out of the political and economic crisis which had lasted for far too long. Podgorica, the capital of the country, one of the smallest in Europe, is self-assured and modern today. The people in the young state are facing the task of redefining their identity. It still needs to be discovered which traditions they want to rely on here. We need to create a new identity, which will help us find our way in the world of the 21st century in Europe. We should try to appreciate our small place, because we do not need a big one. We are small and do not need much. That is the entire wisdom. That could be a concept for our success. Stari Bar, the old part of the port city of Bar, is just a few kilometers from the coast in the south of the country. As well as Byzantine Orthodox and Roman Catholic culture, we also find the legacy of the Islamic Ottoman Empire here. Almost a fifth of the population of Montenegro are Muslims. Suryo Mustafic is a journalist and chairman of the Islamic community of Bar. His family have lived here for many generations. I lived for six years in Novi Sad, one year in Sarajevo, several months in America and in other countries of the world. But I always came back to Old Bar. For me, the most beautiful place in the world. This old town is a part of me, an inseparable part, something I'm so closely connected with, like the need for sleep, food or other basic needs. With the end of Ottoman rule, the city became part of Montenegro in 1878 but Muslims continue to live here together with Orthodox and Catholic Christians. I remember the exact details of my first visits to this mosque, the prayers, the first encounter with the walls of the old town and the spires of the Catholic Church. At the time, I did not know that it was a Catholic church, I only knew that it was the spire of a church. This is because in our family, they did not teach us to differentiate between religions. The only difference between us was that we celebrated different holidays. Here, religions, cultures, traditions and people have intermingled so much that none of us has only one identity. There are several layers of identity in every person. In terms of nationality, I describe myself as a Bosnian. In terms of religion, I am a Muslim or a follower of the Islamic faith. It does occur to me, though, that this religious identity is much stronger in me, probably because religion rests most deeply inside a person. For 
many tourists, Montenegro is a real discovery today. The old town of Kotor, which is protected by UNESCO, in particular is a meeting point for visitors from all over the world. For the inhabitants of Kotor, in particular those from long-established families, life within the historic walls means a part of their self-conception as cosmopolitan municipal citizens. I consider it a privilege to live in Kotor. This rich cultural heritage here prepares us to recognize connections with other cultural centers. So, when we visit larger centers, we can understand that a part of our own identity does not live only in this city. The Socialist People's Party, SNP, as the biggest pro-Serbian opposition in the country, led the resistance against Djukanovic's efforts to gain independence. It remained loyal to Slobodan Milosevic, accused of war crimes until his downfall in October 2000. But after the defeat in the referendum on independence, a radical process of reorientation towards a pro-European party emerged under the new leadership of Serjan Milic. Serjan Milic, chairman of the SNP since 2006, often travels to Vipazar, the place of his childhood. A small fishing village is on the Skutari Lake, which forms the border with Albania. The tranquil nature, with its rich diversity of species, is also attracting increasing numbers of day trippers from the coastal beaches, which are overcrowded in summer. My my late grandfather had a barber's shop in the centre of Vrpazar. I never had the talent for cutting hair, but I did sit there and listen to the stories about what the place and the region was like in the past. I am no conservative. I'm not someone who thinks everything that happened in the past is right, but I am worried that a people that does not know its past will also have no future. In The Pelican, the restaurant of his uncle, tradition is maintained. Guests are entertained with local specialities here. These products are manufactured in the village of Ostros, which is right nearby. It is mainly Albanians who live there. The honey comes from areas where Serbs and Montenegrins live. Maybe this is the right guide for how Montenegro can be unified. It will be unified by the food it offers. And there is no politics here. The journey towards Montenegro's independence began in 1997, when Prime Minister Djukanovic broke with Milosevic and came out openly against his policies. He managed to get the leadership of the governing party on his side. With the help of the Albanian and Bosnian minorities, he was also elected President of the Montenegrin Republic in the same year, with a narrow winning margin. There is no doubt that Milosevic and his apparatus saw in me a motor for the emancipatory ideas of moving Montenegro in the direction of full independence. He certainly had the idea of dealing with me in the same way that he and his regime usually did with political opponents. The 
the forces loyal to Milosevic were not prepared to simply accept the decision. The day before the inauguration of Djukanovic on 14th of January 1998, they tried to storm the government building in Podgorica. The action failed. The police were on the side of Djukanovic. The Yugoslavian army did not intervene. His split from the Serbian leadership made the new president a star abroad, a spearhead of change in Serbia-Montenegro, a champion of ethnic tolerance and an ally against the enemy, Milosevic. For Kocha Pavlovic, the change also meant the opportunity of heading in a new direction. He finished working as a journalist to be able to dedicate himself fully to his political visions. I am sure it's impossible to combine the mindset of a politician and that of a journalist in the same body. I believe these two mindsets would be in a constant conflict of interests. It's only possible to be either a politician or a journalist. The moment a journalist becomes a politician, he has to stop being a journalist. In the midst of impassable mountains lies the old capital of Zetinje. This used to be the political heart of Montenegro. An Orthodox prince bishop from 1910 King ruled his small country from here. There are still patriots here today. I wish you a good day. This is the book of Kniga, the book of books from Cetinia in Montenegro, one of the best known organizations in Europe. If you've heard nothing from us, you've made a big mistake. There is a nice phrase my friend said when someone asked him how he was. He said, I'm mad enough to be normal here. That is a rough reflection of the local state of mind. The books of Knigge mocks taboo themes with surreal humour in television and radio shows. Did you know that the last Montenegrin king, King Nicola, when Montenegro lost its independence in 1918, he ruled at the time. Did you know that King Nicola had many, many daughters? He had a big family, and he sold them all for marriage to European courts. Did you know that? But they and the inhabitants of Zetinja are proud that Montenegro was its own state from 1878 to 1918, small but recognized by Europe's great powers. At the time, Zetinja was a capital alongside Vienna, Paris and St. Petersburg. An English traveler, however, described Zetinja at the start of the 20th century as a doll's town no one has ever played with. Above all else, we are Montenegrins. In this state, there are different nationalities, and in my mind, they are mostly Montenegrins, and we are proud of this. The Kingdom of Montenegro was small and poor, but independent. In Zetinje, there were 13 foreign embassies, including the French one in its chic Art Nouveau style, and in the classicist style, the Austro-Hungarian embassy. What do we really love about Cetinje? It's precisely these contrasts which this city has, which was the centre of Montenegro in history. An old residential city with all the attributes which come with this name, embassies and other institutions which belong to it. Maybe you should have interviewed other people. It was a complete mistake to pick us.
The Dormitel Mountain in the north of Montenegro was a fiercely contested area during the Second World War, the center of the partisans. In 2006, most people here voted to remain in the joint state with Serbia. Up to the start of the 20th century, practically no state authority reached the isolated mountain region of Montenegro. The population was organized into clan structures. The Bojovic family belonged to the Bojovici clan. Some of the family still live off small farming and hunting today. The son, Radovan, owns a hotel in the Dumita National Park. He is well behaved. He is the best of my children. I have seven. Seven. For me, he is the best and my favorite. What kind of life have you had, Mum? None at all. Black and, my God, sad. But my children, my children were good. And that is the only thing that saved me. They were well behaved and learned well. They ask Mum if Dad was faithful to you. Oh no, God no. He liked going to see women, to see girls when he was younger. But now he has become twisted. Velko Bojovic, oldest family member, famous for his marksmanship, fought on the side of the partisans in the Second World War. For me, hunting is great. You see, I still take my gun with me at 82 years of age. I go hunting and shoot wolves. Just a few days ago, I came across one, but he escaped. I could never forget this wolf here. Two years ago, up in the meadow, he dashed forward by chance, and I followed him until I had him. He weighed 75 kilograms. Those with the hats are nearly all members of the Bojovic family, apart from two strangers. This one here is Bosko Bojovic. He was a sniper, a really dangerous sniper. Radovan Bojovic is looking to the future and with his hotel he's relying on international guests. Winter sports and hiking tourism are still in the initial stages but he sees the naturalness of the landscape and the inhabitants as an attraction for holiday visitors. And with regard to the past, there is still the family register of the Bojovic clan with a meter-long family tree. Well, I'm kind of proud of this book. Since the year 1500, everything is written here. How our ancestors struggled, how they fought for freedom, colonized this area, survived and fought during the wars against the Turks, Austria-Hungary and in the Second World War. That is a genuine Montenegrin cap. My father wore it for 80 years. My grandfather and great-grandfather wore it and now I do. When I die, I want to be wearing it and not the one of Milo Dukanovic and his group from Podgorica. We fought for this cap, both the Serbs and also the Montenegrins, according to the motto, only unity will save the Serbs. We're all orthodox in a way, and at the same time, I feel I am a Serb, but no one can take it away from me that I'm a Montenegrin. Fog, cold, 
Meter-high snow and poor streets isolate the villages in the north from the outside world. It is like this in the village of Mala Zerna Gora, Little Montenegro, where Obrad Mumin lives with his wife, son and sister. Once there were 70 inhabitants here, and now there are around 20, 25 at most. No more spend the winter here. All grandfathers and grandmothers, and then goodbye, there is no one left. There's not a living soul remaining. The short summer is for preparing for the hard winter which lasts for six months here. Some animals are slaughtered, the meat is smoked and cured and homegrown vegetables are stored. In summer it is nice and in winter it is freezing and it is dangerous. The winter is hard, a lot of snow falls. We look after ourselves with everything. We bring the provisions into the house, arrange everything. We manage somehow. But if you've not taken precautions, no feed for the cattle and no food, then you cannot live. When they were still children, Obrad Mumin and his sister lost their parents. For example, the meat here is from last year. We smoked it and now we keep cutting a little bit off to eat it. And we prepared cabbage here. It's already pickled. My God, we'll be able to eat this soon. This is all our own produce. We can't remember our father and we don't remember much about our mother. We looked after ourselves alone, and if you think anything was left to us, then you're mistaken. Only a few of these buildings, not even animals. But we still managed somehow. Actually, the work needs to be spread out, but with us, nothing is divided. I even do more men's work than him, and he does no women's work. There you have it. We knit a lot in winter, you know. In summer, we have no time for this. In winter, we then switch on the television and take the needles or also the spindle. My God, we still have one with a treadle drive. We spin, we knit socks, pullovers, that's all. We're cut off for six months, and that is the only reason why we want to get out of here one day. If you need medical assistance, you'll die here because you can't get to a doctor. It will hardly be possible to stop the migration from the north. The higher classes of the school in the village of Njegovudja, which Radovan Bojovic also went to, are soon going to close because the number of pupils is too low. The inhabitants are fighting against this. It is impossible for these children to go to another school because it is very difficult for them even to come here. The higher classes of this school must not be abolished because of the climate conditions. In winter, there's a lot of snow here, as well as storms. We will insist that the children are not sent to another school. The closure of the school would not only be bad because of the children, it would also mean further migration of the already small population from this area. The 
the wild north. It is still the poorest region in Montenegro today, despite its beauty. But tourism is also a beacon of hope here. The wild beauty in Montenegro, anyway, you see, is uh, uh, really true. Because uh, during the centuries ago, there was a lot of force in uh, this area in Montenegro and that uh, uh, made our people uh, uh, stronger to survive uh, those uh, very, very uh, bad conditions. I am uh, working in tourism and uh, I can say that uh, the tourism made me uh, soft, softer in Seoul. With their camp in the mountains around Koloshin, Miki Bulatovic and his father rely on individual tourism. Uh, and the most of people uh, that are coming here in, uh, in this area are uh, uh, in love with the uh, mountain. They really like the mountains and uh, uh, I don't know, they, uh, they are looking for something they cannot uh, find in their uh, countries. They eat our traditional food. Uh, everything we offer them here is uh, producted and uh, made in our uh, ranch, our farm uh, beside Tara River and here. So young Montenegrins from the north are continuing to move to the coast and foreign visitors are moving to the replicated sled huts in which herdsmen used to protect themselves against wolves. Well, tourism, like everything in life, has good and bad sides. The bad side of tourism is that it has led to many customs and traditions being introduced which are not in line with Montenegro's tradition. Although Branko Casanegra himself is among those profiting from tourism, he regrets the sale of property to foreign investors. This phrase was one of the first I heard from my late father, who spent part of his life in America. He worked hard there to be able to buy us property here. When I asked him why he did it, he said, whoever sells his ground, sells his freedom. I firmly believe in this. Investors have been coming more and more since 2006 from the whole of Europe. Russians, Irish, British, some see this as a sellout and accuse the ruling party of dishonest wheeling and dealing. I have to admit, however Mr. Dukanovic affects someone else, his goal was always clear, personal enrichment. His goal was not an independent Montenegro. This is just a byproduct of what he planned from 97 up till now. Ulcin, in the south of the country, is inhabited mainly by Albanians. In 1999, Montenegro accommodated thousands of Kosovo Albanian refugees here. The war in the neighboring province became the most dangerous moment in the split from Yugoslavia for Montenegro. Djukanovic decided to remain neutral and accept tens of thousands of refugees. The tension was high. 7,000 Yugoslavian troops under Belgrade's command were stationed in the country. They faced 10 to 15,000 Montenegrin police, including well-armed special troops. We knew very well that accepting so many Kosovo-Albanian refugees in Montenegro, as well as many other risks, 
also risked revenge for Milosevic against our country. In fact, Milosevic tried several times to get the Yugoslavian army to attack the Kosovo-Albanian refugees. Montenegro, once famous for vendettas and partisans, abolished compulsory military service in 2006. Of the 63 tanks that the independent Montenegro received from the joint army with Serbia, 62 were destroyed. The last tank was put in a museum. On the sandy beach of Ulcin, the southernmost town in the country, there is a lot of hustle and bustle only in the summer. At this time, the small town is flooded with tourists from Kosovo, the former refugees. The refugees from Kosovo, our brothers, we have the same roots, the same blood, came here and entire families were welcomed in every house, mosque and bank, especially in the old town where I come from. You have to imagine what it was like here until the 1990s, when the whole of Europe was here. For nearly more than seven months we had foreign visitors here from all over the world. And that's what it was, a paradise. We have visitors from Serbia, from Kosovo, mainly coming to us. The former refugees now come as tourists, not to be able to live a normal life. As Albanians, we are 85% here. We voted yes in the referendum. This means we gave a lot to make the state of Montenegro independent from Serbia. And that is why we are not happy that we have not been given what was promised to us. More guaranteed seats for Albanians in the parliament were promised. A corresponding paragraph of the law for the protection of minorities was declared unconstitutional and was annulled after the referendum, however. Today, Izmed Karamanaga is working to get the old town of Ulcin recognized as a UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site. The history is very rich from old Romans, from Venetians, from Serbs, so Slavs we say who came in the 7th century, then Ottomans came, the Venetian Republic later and so on. Throughout history it has been shown how the population has been able to live together here. A harmony, an example like nowhere else in the world. A large part of the minorities in the country share this view and are proud of Montenegro's tradition of inter-ethnic tolerance. This includes Sulio Mustafic from Bar, which is just a few kilometers north of Ulcin. The wealth is in the diversity. This is the Balkans in microcosm. Everything you can find here in Bar can also be found in the entire Balkans. Fortunately, there have been no serious conflicts for almost a thousand years between the people living in Bar. On its journey towards independence, Montenegro has managed to cope with some dangerous situations, not least because of the cohesion and mutual respect of its ethnic groups. My first dream was to pass Hall River, because when I was a child I, I didn't know how long this river is and uh, there was no rafting that, that time and there was no uh, the way how to go down than to swim. You could only swim and when I was a teenager we started with uh, business, with making uh, rafting tours in Tara River and uh, I passed it uh, maybe more than 100 times. The Tara is the longest river in Montenegro and, after the Grand Canyon, the second longest canyon in the world. Another secret of this small country, 
that it is now sharing with more and more visitors from all over the world. I couldn't uh, live without this river. Uh, simply, I can say that the Tara flows through my veins and uh, I feel that uh, I belong to this river and this river belongs to me.